Welcome everybody to Drupal GovCon 2021. This is Unraveling Drupal's Migrate API. The slide deck is already available, so you can follow along. My name is Mauricio Dinarte. My pronouns are he, him, and I go by Dinarcon on Drupal.org and on Twitter. That is my email address, uh, my Drupal.org profile, and a link to my personal website. I am from Nicaragua beautiful country known as the land of lakes of volcanoes and we mean it we have many freshwater lakes and many volcanoes some of which are active so if you want to have a wild adventure uh, feel free to come i collaborate with agaric a boston-based worker-owned cooperative uh, but we have people all over the place uh, myself in nicaragua some people in europe some people in the united states and collaborators in other countries as well um, I, as I alluded before, I also have this personal website called understanddrupal.com in which I write uh, about Drupal basics, site building concepts, migrations, and in the future other topics uh, in English, Spanish, and French in text and video format. So if you speak any of those languages, also check, check the website. Particularly uh, related to this presentation, um, I wrote a series of 31 articles on Drupal migrations uh, in the context of, if you don't know anything about the Migrate API, by reading this uh, series, you are going to get the basics, uh, understanding of how this works. Um, I assume that you have some knowledge already because this is an intermediate slash advanced presentation. Uh, and even though I will be alluding and mentioning some concepts at the very beginning, I still expect that you are already familiar with some of the things that I will be presenting. Also, I produce a migration course that goes way deeper into, you know, the Migrate API, how to migrate multiple entities, how to debug migrations and, and many other topics. So I also invite you to check them out. Um, so let's start. Uh, the first part is just going to be a rundown of some of the concepts that you need to be aware of. Uh, for the most part, I will just be mentioning them. And uh, at the end of this section, I'm going to share a link to a video presentation, some, something like this, where it is you know, a, a full uh, presentation just talking about those concepts so you can uh, know more of the, about them if needed. So, most of the discussions today are going to focus on the process section of the migration. Why? Because many times the source is either something that you know or something that is easy to configure. So there is not much to talk there. Similarly, the destination uh, is very well known. 99% of the time it will be a Drupal content entity. So not much to configure there. So the focus will be how to transform the data as you get it from your source into the format that Drupal expects it in the destination. So again, uh, we're going to be uh, going through some concepts um, and at the end, I'm going to share a video where you can learn more about them. Uh, for one, you need to know about process plugin configuration, how uh, they work, what configuration options they may have, uh, how to specify uh, the source, what are the many different source plugins that are available. Some come with Drupal core, others are available in contributed modules like Migrate Plus. All of that uh, you need to have some familiarity with because these are the tools that you're going to be using when writing custom migrations. Also, you need to be familiar on how to set um, subfields. For that, there are a couple of ways in which you can know which subfields are available. One way is looking at the class that implements the specific field type that you're working on. When you find the class, you look for the schema method and in the return value, there should be a, a, an array called columns and that is going to determine what subfields are available for a specific field type. If you are not comfortable with navigating the Drupal source code, that is totally fine. Uh, you can find references online and in my website, understanddrupal.com, I wrote one uh, in which I take all the fields provided by Drupal core 
and some of the more popular contributed modules. And I, you know, specify what subfields are available, if there is a default subfield, the classes that provide them, and some extra information, as you can see on the top right. Something to consider when working with subfields is that even though the database allows for some, you know, columns or, or specific values to be set, like your URI, title, and options, you also need to consider your specific site configuration. You might have a, a link field that doesn't allow the title to be set. So even if you specify it, uh, Drupal will not render it. Like even if you migrate something into that column, into that value, Drupal will not render it. Uh, so be mindful about that. It is a combination between knowing the underlying data structure and also knowing your specific site configuration. Uh, we also need to know about how to set multiple values. Uh, normally this is referred to as the delta and the general syntax is machine name of the field slash delta slash shoe field. And um, in this case, I am manually specifying the deltas like zero, one, and two, but you can also create process pipelines in which uh, the deltas are not known in advance. So you can accommodate multi-value fields, whether it is one, two, three, four, or even more values. So uh, in, that, in that case, you make the migration more dynamic. Another thing that you need to be aware of is process plugin change. Uh, so the output of one process plugins becomes the input of the next one. And at the end of the change, uh, whatever the end result is, is going to be assigned to the destination field. Something that will also be helpful uh, in some circumstances are what's called source constants and pseudo fields. Again, all of these uh, you can learn more in the video that I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, one last thing that you need to be mindful of, especially with working with uh, configuration entities as your destinations in a migration, is that you can have base properties. In the case of Node, for example, the title, the UID, the type, if it is sticky or not, uh, if it is promoted to the homepage or not, uh, all of those are called base properties of the entity itself. In addition to that, you can have fields uh, attached to the entity. For example, uh, in a out of the box Drupal installation with the standard profile, you get an article content type with uh, a body field, a image field, a text field. So why is it important to understand that these are field API elements compared to base properties? because what I was just writing before about the deltas, about the subfields, that applies for field API fields. If you're working with base properties, you simply assign the value without uh, delta, without subfield, because there is, there is none. And in addition to those two, uh, you also can have pseudo fields, which you know basically is any arbitrary string that you come up with to hold a temporary value that you're going to be using later on uh, in your process pipeline. So. All of this uh, is going to serve as a basis for the migration that we're going to write. Um, I have written a lot uh, con of content ab about Drupal migration. So, you know, uh, there is an article on my website also about what properties and fields come out of the box uh, in a Drupal installation, you know, for nodes, taxonomy terms, users, blog content entities, media entities, and so on. And there is a separate article focused only on commerce entities. So if you install the commerce suite of modules, um, you get a reference for that as well. So I invite you to, to check those resources. And this is the session recording that I was alluding to before. Uh, by looking at that, you will learn more in depth about you know, what I just uh, flew by. But the, the important part of the presentation today is understanding how to think uh, in a way that will make writing migrations more efficient. So that's what we're going to do next. Uh, before doing so, I want to share this quote by Leah Bureau, author of CSS Secrets. Understanding the process of finding a solution is far more valuable than the solution itself. And the reason why I mentioned this is because I have seen many people uh, in 
support channels asking how do I do this? How do I do that? And it is okay if you have very specific questions and someone can give you very specific answers. But if you are able to understand how the system as a whole works and how this transformation from your source to your destination is supposed to flow, uh, you will be able to tackle problems that you are not familiar with at the moment. Um, over the last couple of years, I have worked in many, many migration projects, and I didn't have all the answers right at the start. Uh, most of the time, what I had to do is follow the recommendations that I will be providing today to understand, you know, my source structure, my destination structure, and the transformation in between. So that's why I will be sharing today. Feel free to ask your question in the chat, and I will be addressing them at the end of the presentation. So uh, we're going to go over these via examples. One of them uh, is in the context of an upgrade. So if we are upgrading from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, and let's say that in Drupal 7, we have a content type storing user information. And in Drupal 9, we actually want to use user entities for that. So how do we do this? Um, one thing to start with is that in Drupal, um, it is good and recommended to think in terms of entities. And there are two large buckets of entities in Drupal. One is content entities and the other one is configuration entities. In my own experience, and I have heard other people, you know, share the same, about 99% of the time, you will be migrating into content entities. And in that case, you have nodes, users, taxonomy terms, files, media entities, and so on. Um, there is an issue at the moment to include um, another entity that is not either configuration and content, uh, and this is in the context of the DB log module, but that is beyond the scope of this presentation. Uh, for our purpose, think about this, content versus configuration entities. And in the case of content entities, uh, I want to dive a little bit deeper. You need to be aware of three things. For one, what are the entity properties, also known as base field definitions, that are provided for that entity? And this is what I was alluding to before. Like in the case of nodes, you have the node ID, the version ID, land code, type, status, UID of who created the node, the title, the creation, timestamp, and so on. Why is this important? Because if you need to set any of these properties, you need to know the name, and you need to know which ones are available. And that link at the bottom is uh, going to, you know, to, to load the, the reference that I said before. What other things you need to be aware? Is the content entity that you're working on fieldable? Uh, like in the case of nodes, you can attach uh, the tags uh, field, the image field, and so on. An example of an entity that is not fieldable is file entities. Another thing that you need to consider is, is this, uh, does this entity allow to have multiple bundles? Like uh, for nodes, you have multiple content types. For taxonomy terms, you have multiple vocabularies. For media, you have multiple media types. So that's another thing to, to consider. And again, there are a couple of entities that are not bundables, like users and files. So keeping this mental model and understanding these three elements are going to help you when you know write, writing migrations and how to make transformations. So going back to our example, uh, we need to do some mapping from the Drupal 7 um, information that we get and the Drupal 9 entity that we have. So in Drupal 7, let's say that we have the node ID, the BID, you know, other entity properties, and then we have the, a field because, uh, you know, this is a node, and nodes by default do not have a, an email address. So I had to attach a field in Drupal 7 to store this information. Now in Drupal 9, I want to make this conversion, and, you know, I have a UID, a LAN code, a name, a pass to store the password, mail to store the email, and so on. So basically, now that I have this, you know, list of what fields and what base properties are available for each entity, I start making a, a table or a map. So the title, it's going to be assigned as the username. Uh, from field email, I'm going to populate the email address of the user. 
in the case of created, uh, when the node was created, it's going to be assigned as to when the user was created. But then we have an interesting use case, a status. Uh, the name of the property exists on both nodes and users, but the meaning is different. In the case of nodes, a status represents whether the node is published or not. In the case of users, a status represents whether the user is blocked or active on the website. So the meaning itself uh, is different. And then you have two choices. For one, you can say, I do want to map the status. Uh, in that case, uh, unpublished um, node in Drupal will represent a block user. Uh, and maybe you want to have that in case of having references and you want to keep those references even if the user itself is blocked. Or you might decide, really, I do not want to migrate Croft. I do not want to migrate legacy data that is no longer being be going to be used. So let's just keep any node that is unpublished because that it will not be used in the new site. So that is something for you to determine. I'm going to show you in a moment the moderation that I did and what decision I took. But again, there is no right or wrong answer in this. It is up to you to, to make a choice. That being said, uh, this is my migration. On the left, you see the migration definition file. And as you can see, it's relatively simple. My source uh, is using a plugin provided by Drupal core, D7 underscore node. And I am uh, specifying which uh, node type I want to fetch. In the case of the destination, I am uh, saying that I want to create entity users. And remember that users do not have bundles, so there is no need to define such thing. And as I said at the beginning, the main part of the migration for the most part is going to be the process section. So in this case, I am assigning the title from the node to the name of the user. Uh, the username that is uh, that that we can see in number one in the image on the left. In number two, we can see that uh, field UD email was a field API field. So I have the structure of the delta and the sub field, and I am basically drilling down into that hierarchy. And whatever the email is, I assign it to the mail property of the user. Notice that it is mail, not email, not something else. That's why knowing which properties are available and their exact names is important. And in this case, I assign the email. Then the created uh, is assigned one to one uh, in number three. And then in number four, I also assign a status. And again, this was my choice of unpublished nodes becoming block users on the new site. Then in number five, I can continue adding mappings, for example, a default time zone. Uh, in number six, I specify the init property. In the context of a user entity, in it uh, represents the email address used by the user when they initially register on the site. You know, you can change your email later on, but the initial one will always be recorded in that property. And you have more properties like roles, for example. And let's say that I didn't have any role information in Drupal 7, so I do not make any mapping for roles. And, you know, this is just like a, a, a short list, but there are more properties in the user entity. And also, even out of the box, there are fields attached to the user entity that I am not setting. For example, the user, user, um, the user profile picture. So that, that's what uh, we have here. Now, on the right, uh, we, we see Drupal 7 source at the top and D9 destination at the bottom. Uh, this is just a preview of how the data is uh, fetched into the system and what data we're going to send to Drupal to a store uh, as my destination. The one thing to note is that uh, in the image at the top on the right, where it says number three, created, notice that the created is at Unix timestamp. And this is important to know because if you uh, need to populate creation timestamp, updated timestamp, or date fields, the format is important if you need to make any transformation. And in my website and in the list of 31 days of art, uh, migration articles, um, there is one dedicated to how to do transformations for dates. So again, just keep in mind that you need to be aware of how the data arrives and 
transform that into what uh, Drupal might expect. Okay. Now uh, we're going to go over another example. Uh, this is a little bit more involved. This is about converting Drupal 7 URL fields to Drupal 9 social links fields. Uh, the context of this is also an upgrade from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, but in this particular example, I want to highlight what happens if you are using a module that doesn't have a Drupal 9 alternative or doesn't have a direct upgrade path to Drupal 9. Maybe, uh, one second, I am being told by the moderator that the slides are not being updated. Okay, so it looks like it looks like we are on the same page. A couple of people reporting that I am on the right uh, slide, so let's continue. Sorry for the the distraction there, uh, and and thanks for letting me know that something might be wrong there. So going back to the example, uh, the context is a module that is not available in Drupal nine coming from Drupal seven or a change in implementation because I want to leverage some new functionality. So those are the links to the specific uh, project pages on Drupal.org. And in here, uh, this is the UI for both Drupal 7 and Drupal 9. And let's think a little bit about what we're seeing here. In Drupal 7, I have URL fields. And in fact, I have two separate fields, one for the Facebook URL, one for the Twitter URL. Um, and as you can see, you enter the whole thing, including the domain. On the right, I am using a separate uh, module called social links in which you have a drop down for selecting the social network. And then you only uh, enter what is what would be like the handle, like your Twitter handle instead of the whole URL. So for there, we, we see a couple of differences. For one, we're going from two separate fields into one. Two, instead of entering the full URL, we only enter the uh, uh, the user the username, and even though we are only showing Twitter and Facebook, the field on the right actually allows for many more options like YouTube, uh, Instagram, and, and even more than that. So, again, uh, exemplifying how to do this transformation. In order to to, to do this, let's say that we have no clue how these modules uh, work under the hood. So let's try to figure it out. For one, uh, we need to understand that that is structure, both for the Drupal 7 field and for the Drupal 9 field. Normally, you do this by looking at the field definition. So in Drupal 7, this is done by looking at hook field schema. And similarly to Drupal 9, you should see uh, an array uh, with a super array structure called columns and then another uh, super array structure with the specific name of the subfields in this case value title and attributes and the description that are provided are you know somewhat intuitive uh, in the case of value it says the url string uh, in the case of title the title of the url and in the case of attributes, it is important to know that it is a serialized array. So that just give me a, a pointer that I might have to be dealing with uh, some blob data that I need to unserialize in as part of my transformation process. That is going to be determined later. So for Drupal 7, I can have a good idea. But in the case of Drupal 9, uh, if I look for the field definition, the schema method, uh, then I don't get a lot of, of information back. I get that I have a social column and I have a link column, but what's up with that? What I am supposed to enter in social and what I am supposed to enter in link. Uh, for this, uh, we are going to have, we need to dig a little bit deeper and I'm going to show two approaches. One is more technical than the other. Uh, and let's start with the more technical one. 
one thing that I do very, very often when I don't know the data structure or I need to confirm the, my assumptions after looking at the field definitions is I log into Drupal 7 and I create some demo content. I log into Drupal 9 and I create some demo content. And after creating the demo content of both sites, I inspect the database records of both sites to see how the information is being stored. What we're seeing here is a Drupal 7, a URL field. So for one, I look at that, I look for the table and then I start showing the records of the table. How does Drupal works under the hood for storing this information? You see in number one that uh, you get the machine name of the field and then underscore and then the the subfield as and for each subfield you are going to have one column in the database so that's why I have field you need Twitter URL value title and attributes those correspond to the three columns that we saw in the in the hook definition before in number two you see Delta. So again, this being a field that Delta represents uh, in a possible multi-value uh, field, what element this is. Delta zero is the first element, Delta one is the second element and so on. And, and in number three, you see like the value title and attributes again, with a special mention that in this case, attributes is no, but it, if it had a value, it would be a serialized uh, a string. Uh, using the PHP serialized uh, function. So how would I get to uh, this HTTPS, twitter.com slash drupal.com from my migration? I would refer to it as the machine name of the field, field underscore UD underscore Twitter underscore URL, slash zero for the delta, slash value for that specific subfield. So that's, uh, how I get the information in Drupal 7, how I get the information in Drupal 9, very similar. Uh, notice that in this case, the same field um, allows for both uh, Twitter and, and Facebook. So the records is actually, you know, the Delta, I have Delta zero and I have Delta one, one for each of the of the records. In the case of how the, the, the columns are structured, it is very similar, you have the, machine name of the field, underscore, and then the subfield. In this case, social and link. And you can see here that for social, we are only storing Twitter. Uh, and then for the link, we are only storing, you know, the handle, you Drupal.com. For Facebook, again, we only uh, uh, store Facebook uh, for social and then the link to the, to the Facebook page. Uh, a couple of things to note. The list of values for social is a pretty fine list. So you either find that in the code or you can find that based on the demo value that you entered on the website. Uh, as I alluded before, for the link, you only use the handle, no domain needed. And in fact, if you put a domain, it will not work. And uh, if you want to populate uh, these fields in your Drupal 9 migration, you do it by machining of the field, slash delta, slash subfield value, whether it is social or link. So that's one way to do it. Uh, again, this is very technical. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable with uh, querying the database, there is another approach. What is it uh, using the DBL model? So the first part is the same. You go to Drupal 7, you go to Drupal 9, and you create some demo content. But instead of having to query the database, you install the DBL module and you inspect the entities that were created and with the demo values. So after, after doing so, you can find that, you know, the, the field UD book URL has a, a subkey of UND that represents the LAN code, the language code. And then the, the structure, like we saw it before, zero represents the delta, and then the list of the three subfields. Uh, that is uh, the image on the top, on the top left, and being Drupal seven, and on the bottom right being Drupal nine, something very similar. Field UD social links, uh, and then X default represents the language code, and then zero and one represents the delta, and for each of them you have social and link as the subfields. So now that I have this information, what do I do with it? Well, I need to come up with a process pipeline that is going to 
take the value from the uh, data structure uh, in Drupal 7 into what Drupal 9 is expecting. So for example, it should be able to detect if it is a Facebook URL and include Facebook as my social uh, value and then extract the, the link to the Facebook page. If it is a Twitter uh, URL, you need to be able to detect that, assign Twitter as my social and then extract the handle from it. So uh, the most important part I would say here is doing the detective work. Uh, what transformations need to be needed. Once I have that information, then I can apply those specific uh, changes. And in this case, uh, I resorted to a custom process plugin. In the image on the left, you can see number one, it is called UD Social Links. Uh, I, I am passing to that as my source, both the field for uh, Twitter and Facebook. And under the hood, that uh, process plugin is making the transformation and populating that into field UD social links, which is my Drupal 9 field. A couple of things to note here. For one, um, I am purposely hiding the implementation of the transformation behind a custom process plugin because otherwise, if I wanted to do it in the migration itself, I would have to use a very long uh, plugin chain and it would become harder to maintain, harder to modify if there are changes. So it is often a good idea if you have complex transformations to just create a, a custom process plugin and, and put your logic there. Uh, that way you can also like test, uh, like write tests against that process plugin to verify that it is working as expected. Uh, another thing uh, on the, on, in the image on the right, you can see, uh, what information is received by this process plugin as, as input. Uh, I mean, because I am sending both the Twitter and the Facebook URL, you can see that, you know, necessary structure of in input like zero and one and representing the Twitter URL and the Facebook URL. And because these are field API fields in Drupal 7, then you get the Delta and the sub, uh, sub fields uh, values. In the output, you see what Drupal is expecting. Uh, it is a multi-value field, so you see zero and one, but then uh, just directly apply the subfields like social and link. Uh, I'm not going to show the, the code for the process uh, plugin, but this is part of a course um, that we teach, and you can go to that URL, uh, udrupal.com slash upgrades, to, to get the source code uh, and get more information about the code. Everything that I am showing here today uh, is available as open source projects uh, in github.com slash dinnercon. So feel free to explore that uh, to find many of these examples. Okay, uh, let's talk about another example. And in this case, uh, again, from a Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 migrations, and we're starting to, to see a theme here uh, because we are in the middle of making a lot of these upgrades. Uh, so we're going to move from image entities to media entities in Drupal 9. And those media entities are going to eventually be uh, attached to nodes. So uh, one thing to understand, and this is very important, and I, and I will mention it again later, even though I alluded to having a look at the database to understand the underlying data structure and especially how the data is stored. Something that is very important in Drupal is not think in terms of database tables, but instead think about Drupal entities because the, the Married API is built on many other APIs uh, on Drupal. And uh, when you say, I want to create a user, it is actually going to use the entity API to, to create the user entity. If you say, I want to create nodes, it is going to use the entity API to create nodes. So very uh, rarely you are going to be writing database records directly when writing a migration. It is possible, uh, but you will have to go out of what uh, is normally done to be able to do that. So always think in terms of entities and not about database tables or records. That being said, um, if you want to make transformations, for example, you have a node 
uh, entity that has an implicit relationship to user entities because every node is created by a user. Uh, in the case of articles, for example, there is an explicit relationship in the default article content type that allows for multiple taxonomy terms and one image field, and you, we can attach multi-value paragraph if we want. So if we want to change how this relationship works out of the box, then we need to understand uh, where to introduce the change. In this case, uh, instead of going from node to files directly, we're going to create a relationship from nodes to medias and then from media to files. Um, so that's basically what we need to accomplish in our migration, like having that extra intermediate, intermediary um, media migration. And for the most part, this is not uh, strictly necessary, but highly recommended that for each entity type and for each uh, nesting level, uh, for example, if you had nested paragraph, you had a separate migration. There are ways to work around that, but this is like the best practice or the recommended approach. So uh, as we're going to see in a moment, we're going to have a migration for files, for media entities and for node entities. So with that knowledge, uh, again, I'm not going to explain in detail uh, the, the, the migration. Um, there are recordings about, you know, this from previous presentations. But what I want to highlight is the following. If we only have a file to node migration, on the left, we have the file migration, on the right, we have the node migration. And in the node migration is where we establish the relationship. So for the image field, in this case called field UD main image, we are assigning the target ID subfield, which is going to store the reference to the file itself. How do we establish that reference? Using the migration lookup plugin, we specify the ID of the file migration and what is going to be as the source for the lookup. Something else that we do, because this is an image field, we also want to specify the alt uh, attribute for accessibility purposes. So we are assigning both the reference to the image and the alt attribute in the node migration. Now, what happens if I want to in, to add the media entity in between. The file migration is not changed. The assignments that I did before in the node migration, those now happen in the media migration. And by that, I mean uh, finding the target ID and finding the alt attribute. And because this is a media entity, I can attach more fields to the media entity. So maybe in addition to adding the image, I also want to provide a text field to, to provide credits for that image, like who took the image, for example, or where did you took it from, uh, if you need to provide copyright information, for example. So in this case, uh, on the image on the left, we see number three, fill UD media credit, and we are assigning that uh, to some value that was uh, obtained from the source. So again, the important part is, the relationship that was previously done in the node migration now is performed in the media migration. And what you do in node, uh, you do another lookup, but in, in this case, instead of uh, doing the lookup against the file migration, you do the lookup against the media migration. And in this case, uh, and the image on the right, you can see that we are not assigning alt attributes because you know the media itself the media entity doesn't have an attribute that uh, is already handled in, in the media migration for adding the attribute to the image uh, field. And that's basically it. Uh, once you start understanding that you need to have these extra intermediate migrations and how to write them, um, you, you should be able to write, for example, multi-value nest, uh, multi nested part of migration. This is just like, uh, you will only have to write one extra migration uh, in between. Okay, we're reaching the end of the presentation. Another example that I have is, if you want to alter a migration dynamically to attach an API key, for example. So let's say that you are querying an external API and that API expects uh, in the URL a query string parameter with your API key. But let's say that you don't want to add that to the migration definition file because you know that is code and that will be shared maybe 
in an open source fashion in a public repository and you don't want your API key to be used by someone else. So again, there are many ways to, uh, to handle this. One way is using uh, or implementing hook migration plugins alter. So when you do this, you get an array with all your migration definition files, uh, the YAML converting to a nested PHP structure. And in this case, uh, what do I say? If uh, if this migration with this specific ID is found, look in the hierarchy for the source URLs, and that is an array. So look over that array and fetch the API key from somewhere in number one, we see that, and then you know attach the API key. In this case, I am, uh, I am calling a, a custom method that is probably overkill for the example that I have, uh, but I just want to demonstrate one way to do it. Another alternative in this particular uh, API implementation, I could just like concatenate strings uh, to attach the API key. But you know this is a little bit more flexible. Now, what I want to focus is in number one in the image. How do you get the API key? In this case, I am getting it from settings. I assume I am I'm getting it from a configuration value, but you can also get it from settings like settings.php. You can also get it from uh, PHP environment variable. You can get it from many different ways. The point is that you are not hard coding that value into your code. Uh, so keep that in mind. That's uh, one way to do it uh, from configuration, but you can get it from settings environment variables and other ways. So with all of that being said, uh, these are some example of uh, content model changes that I have to work with uh, over the years, like converting files into media entities. Let's say that you have some location uh, stakes and you want to populate that into address fields. If you have some block of text that you want to move into layout builder, uh, maybe you're using organic group in Drupal 7 and you want to use the group module in Drupal 9. Uh, if you want to convert nodes to user groups or paragraph entities, if you want to embed images in a WYSIWYG as media entities, if you want to transform regular plain text into a structure field, uh, like the social media one that I showed, uh, in some cases you might use regular expression. And something that I want to highlight in this uh, slide is how many times the word entity appeared. And again, in Drupal, especially when working with the Migrate API, let's try not to think about database tables and columns. Let's think about entities. The uh, Drupal Migrate API is going to call the Entity API, and in itself, that's what is going to call more Drupal code to eventually write uh, your your data into the proper tables in the the proper columns, but that's not something that you need to worry about. Let Drupal do that work for you. So uh, with that, that's the end of uh, my journey today, but maybe this is the start for years. So thank you very much to all of these people and more than I can list uh, that has helped me understand that my API over the years, I've been working with it for four or five years already. Um, Remember to check the website, uh, the, the book, the course, and the slide deck is already available. I will also uh, be thankful if you can provide feedback in that URL and you can ping me on Twitter, on Slack, uh, as Dinarcon, or you can send me an email to mauricio.igalic.com. We do a lot of migration projects, a lot of upgrade projects, and we will be happy to help uh, with yours as well. If there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining me today. Okay, it looks like there are no, oh, wait one moment. Okay, there is a question. Migrations that run great in D8 have failed for me in D9. How should I debug? Are there immediate, immediate differences running this in D8 versus D9? So uh, are there differences in the Merit API between Drupal 8 and Drupal 9? For the most part, no. 
for the most part, it is exactly the same API. The one thing that you need to remember is that in Drupal 9, uh, we remove the deprecated code, and that is also the case uh, with Migrate. And for the most part, the deprecated code in the Migrate API has to do with uh, process plugin names. So there are uh, there is a list on Drupal.org that lists all the process plugins. And if you see one of them as deprecated, that means that it was available in Drupal 8, but it is not available in Drupal 9. But for the most part, uh, the API didn't change. Um, that being said, there is a special page on Drupal.org that is called Drupal Change Records. And if you look in that page for the word migrate, uh, you can see everything that has uh, been modified. For the most part, you what you get are additions. Very rarely you get a breaking change. So the only one that I can think of at the moment is uh, the fact that um, some process plugin changed their name. So I, I would invite you to check that. Um, there is a question, is it possible to migrate field collection from Drupal 7? Yes, it is possible. Um, there are plugins uh, and upgrade path to migrate field collections into Drupal, from Drupal 7 into Drupal 9 paragraph. And for the most part, that works out of the box. If you want to go from field collections to something else that is not paragraph, uh, very likely you will have to to write a, a custom migration. But yes, it is possible. And if you are if your target is paragraph, um, there there are automatic upgrade paths for that already in the paragraph module itself. There are migrations uh, to accommodate for that. Another question: A lot of country modules offer their own migration API plugins. What, what's the best method for discovering them and learning about them? Um, so I would say that if you have the technical knowledge, the best way for sure to know what plugins are available in your system is using the plugin manager. Um, in, in the website, I have two articles, one about uh, finding the source plugins and one about finding the destination plugins on your Drupal installation. And at the end of both articles, there is a, a drush command that you can execute. And that drush command, what it's doing under the hood is calling the plugin manager and requesting to provide information about every plugin that is available on the system. As you allude in your questions, the plugins uh, that are available will depend on what modules are enabled on the site. So even though I have tried to provide reference for them, you know, it, you know, it will depend on on your specific installations and and it's in particular what modules are enabled. So one way to do that is to to be certain is uh, calling the plugin manager and requesting that information. And I have those one-liners. Uh, Drush snippets that you can execute to find that information. If you're not comfortable with Drush or, or with that aspect, another way, a little bit technical also, is uh, looking at the source code of the module. Uh, the, the plugins are in, an, in a known uh, structure. So plugins will be in an SRC folder, uh, then a plugin folder, then a migrate folder, and you will have source, uh, process and destination plugins uh, folders uh, for each of the types. If you're looking for automatic upgrade path, they normally come in the the you know the main uh, root of the module uh, slash migrations, and that's one way in which you can find if there is an automatic upgrade path provided by that module. Um, and there are a couple of other ways. Uh, uh, and locations in which you can find migration related code in a module, but those are the two primary ones. The third option would be finding an online resource. And I've been trying to do a lot of that myself uh, in, in my website. It's just like references, like a list of what process plugins are available, the list of what destinations or source plugins are available and so on. So like those are three ways in which you can find uh, what plugins are available. But again, it will depend on your specific installation and what modules are enabled on your site. It looks like those are all the questions. Let me check once more. 
Okay. Yes, uh, there is a, uh, someone sharing that they usually browse through the plugin annotation in the source directory itself. Uh, so yes, that's another technical way to do it. Uh, I would say using the plugin manager it would be more efficient because you don't need to manually browse through the whole code. You let you know Drupal uh, do that for you. And there are no more questions. So thank you very much again for joining me today and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.